Okay, let's uh, begin with a word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are very grateful that we are here this evening. We are thankful for the way that you work in our lives, in the lives of those that we meet. We know, Lord, that we need your presence every minute of every day. We ask for your presence to be here now as we open your word through uh, the sermon done by A.T. Jones back in 1895. And we just ask, Lord, that the spirit that spoke to him through your word then can speak to us now in even clearer tones as we approach the time in which Christ is going to return. Help us, Lord, to understand these things, to apply them to our lives. Forgive us for our sins, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this part here I mentioned two weeks ago um, is sort of the, the nux of the whole issue. That is, we have A.T. Jones addressing a problem that, um, that many people uh, mis misapply or misinterpret or use as a way of um, avoiding the responsibilities that we have in obeying God's word. So the issue, and, and he's going to go through it, but I'll just explain a little bit some of the background here. So the question had to do with what it means to have a sinful human nature. Now, Jones has made this really clear that this has to do with our, our nature and that in order to overcome that nature, we need the mind of Christ. So Christ had our nature, but he didn't have our mind. That is, the carnal mind is subject to the law of God, is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. The, law, the, the carnal mind is enmity against God, not not add enmity against God, but is itself enmity against God. So obviously Christ could not have had a carnal mind. That is the mind of the flesh. He had to have the mind of the spirit. And so that mind that was in Christ can also be in us. But Parminder really tried to obscure this point uh, back in 2017. And this allowed for a type of holy flesh. Uh, in the movement where people could believe that they were not sinning. That is, they could deceive themselves into believing that they are without sin. And so they could see themselves as righteous, even though that was a total delusion. Because if you see yourself as righteous, it is the strongest evidence that you are not. Because those that are seeking to perfect Christian, Christian character will never indulge the thought that they are sinless, even if their lives are irreproachable and they're living representatives of Christ, the closer they come to Christ, the more sinful will they appear in their own eyes. So Jones understood this. He also understood what the flesh was, and he's defined this very well. But now he's going to deal with an objection. And this is an, one of the objections that we often hear when we present Christ as having our nature, a fallen human nature, a sinful human nature, a nature like ours. So Jones begins. Now, as to Christ not having like passions with us, in the scriptures all the way through, he is like us and with us according to the flesh. He is the seed of David according to the flesh. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Don't go too far. He was made in the likeness of sinful flesh, not in the likeness of sinful mind. Do not drag his mind into it. His flesh was our flesh, but the mind was the mind of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus. Therefore, it is written, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If he had taken our mind, however, then, could we ever have been exhorted, could we ever have been exhorted to let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It would have been so already. But what kind of mind is ours? Oh, it is corrupted with sin also. Look at ourselves in the second chapter of Ephesians. 
beginning with the first verse and reading to the third. But the third verse is the one that has this particular point in it. Now, I refer you also to page 191 of the bulletin, to the lessons we studied on the destruction of that enmity. It's kind of interesting, 191, what does that mean to us now? When we see 191? A relationship between 9-11 or 11-9. Yeah, but we, it's also the midst of the 62 weeks, right? 191 BC, okay. right? Yes. And it symbolizes the midst of the week in seventy in in uh, in thirty one A.D. It symbolizes the destruction of that enmity. So it's very interesting that he's referring to page one ninety one to the lessons where we the lessons we studied on the destruction of that enmity because that's the cross. And so, just as if you divide the sixty two weeks. You have two, two 31s, right? Seven times 31, right? 62 weeks, half of 62 weeks is, is 31. And, and there's still weeks. And 31 AD in the midst of the week is when Jesus is crucified. So that 191 symbolizes the cross. So very interesting. Okay. We studied there where the enmity came from. You remember how it got into this world. The ground is covered in this that I have just read. Adam had the mind of Jesus Christ in the garden. He had the divine mind. The divine and human were united sinlessly. Satan came in and offered his inducements through the appetite, through the flesh. Adam and Eve forsook the mind of Jesus Christ, the mind of God that was in them and accepted the suggestions and the leadings of this other mind. Thus they were enslaved to that, and so are we all. Now Jesus Christ comes into the world, taking our flesh, and in his sufferings and temptations in the wilderness, he fights the battle upon the point of appetite. Where Adam and Eve failed, and where sin entered, he fought the battle over, and victory was won, and righteousness entered. He, having fasted 40 days and 40 nights, perfectly helpless, human as ourselves, hungry as we, there came to him the temptation. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. He answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Right. Now, we know that he's actually quoting um, Moses. Because Moses is saying, you know, you were fed. Well, it's, I guess it's not Moses. It's God in Moses' writings. But God's saying, I fed you with manna 40 years in the wilderness to teach you that which you do not know and which your fathers did not know, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God, right? So this, this idea is the 40 years in the wilderness is compared to the 40 days that Christ fasts, right? So there's this connection. For 40 years, they were fed manna. Now we have the 40 days. And during that 40 days, Jesus is going to be tempted at the end of that 40 days. And the temptation is, if thou be the son of God. So what did he hear from the voice of God say 40 days before? What did God's voice say? Thy art, my beloved Solomon, my father. In place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thou art my beloved son. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, 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 in thee or in him I am well pleased, right? So Christ heard the voice of his father. And in spite of what he saw, in spite of how he felt, he trusted because he didn't see himself as the son of God. This is how Satan attacks him. He's saying, well, you're, if you're the son of God, why are you so weak and helpless? But he knows he's the son of God because he doesn't trust his senses. He trusts the word of God, the voice of God 40 days before. And he's going to quote the scripture that deals with the 40 years that they were fed manna in the wilderness, which is the word of God. So he trusts in 
but God feeds him not in what his senses tell him, not by his subjective feelings, but by the word of God. That's how he judges everything. Then Satan took another turn. He argued, you're trusting in the word of God, are you? All right. Here the word of God says, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now you are trusting in the word of God. You jump off here, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. And Jesus answered again, it is written, it is written again, thou shalt not attempt, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Then Satan took Jesus upon an exceeding high mountain um, and showed him all the glory of them too, the glory, the honor, the dignity. He showed the, him all that. And there at that moment, there was stirred up all the ambition that ever appeared in Napoleon or Caesar or Alexander or all of them put together. But from Jesus still, the answer is, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Now, one of the things about each of these temptations in the book uh, Confrontation, which is a collection of Ellen White's articles, I believe from the Review and Herald, they could have been from the Signs of the Times, but um, if you look at that, the book Confrontation up in the Spirit of uh, Prophecy disc, or- I got that book. Yeah, so she goes into much more detail about the temptation in the world, uh, the temptation that happens here after the 40 days in the wilderness. Um, and she did a lot of this writing, but they had to condense it for the book Desire of Ages. So they took a lot of it out, um, but it's, it's quite detailed. And uh, one of the things we see, you know, in, in this whole issue of the temptation is the idea that, that Jesus is really being challenged over his, his loyalty to God. Satan first appears as an angel, and Christ has no way of knowing that he's not, except by knowing the word of God and trusting in his Father. Right? So when but the Satan Satan does reveal his his character, right? When he says, um, you know, he wanted him to worship him. So, uh, so there's lots in that. This is a, an important point. But the main point that, that Jones is trying to show is that Christ, uh, it wasn't his flesh that was righteous. It was his mind, his decisions that he made. But then the devil departed from him for a season, and the angels came and ministered unto him. There was power of Satan. There was the power of Satan conquered in man, in the moment, in the point of appetite, just where that power was gained over man. This man was the first, at the first, had the mind of God. He forsook it and took the mind of Satan. In Jesus Christ, the mind of God is brought back once more to the sons of men, and Satan is conquered. Therefore, it is gloriously true as the word reads in Dr. Young's translation and in the German, as it does in the Greek. We know that the Son of God is come and has given us a mind. Read the last words of 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have the mind of Christ. Put the two transactions together. The German and the Danish and also the Greek are alike. Put the two together. We know that the Son of God is come and has given us a mind, and we have the mind of Christ. Thank the Lord. Read in Romans now. I will read from the Greek, beginning with the 24th verse of the 7th chapter. You remember from the 10th to the 24th verses is that contest. The good I would do, I do not, and the evil I hate, that I do. I find then a law that when I do good, evil is present with me. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. There the flesh has control and draws the mind after it, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Now, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself with the mind 
indeed serve the law of God, or rather serve God's law, literally here, but with the flesh, sin's law. There is then no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> um, that came unexpectedly. <clears throat> Um, there, so then, uh, let me see, there is then now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free from the law of sin and death. So sometimes this is a little bit dense for people to understand, but let's go on and we'll, we'll discuss it. For the law being powerless, in that it was weak through the flesh, God, having sent his own son in likeness of sinful flesh, or of flesh of sin, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the requirement of the law should be fulfilled in us, who not according to the flesh walk, but according to the spirit. For they that according to the flesh are... The things of the flesh, mind, right? So he's reading it literally from the Greek. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but but we mind the things of the flesh if we are living according to the flesh. And those that are living according to the spirit, they mind the things of the spirit. For the mind of the flesh is death. The mind of the spirit, that is the spirit's mind, the one is the flesh mind, and the other is the spirit's mind. So the mind of the spirit is life and peace because the mind of the flesh is enmity toward God or it is not for to the law of God. It is not subject or neither can it be. They that are in the flesh, God please cannot, that is God cannot, that is cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone, the spirit of Christ has not, he is not of them, of him, but of Christ. But if Christ be in you, the body is dead on account of sin, but the spirit is the spirit is life on account of righteousness. So I'm not sure I'd find this helpful. Him reading this sort of mangled Greek translation into English, but the basic idea is that you have these two minds: the mind of the flesh and the mind of the spirit. They're not compatible. And if we have the mind of the flesh, right, if we don't have Christ, the body is dead on account of sin. But if we have the mind of the spirit, we have life, we have righteousness. Jones goes on, our minds have consented to sin. We have felt the enticements of the flesh and our minds yielded. Our minds consented and did the wills and the desires of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. The flesh leads, and our minds have followed. And with the flesh, the law of sin is served. When the mind can lead, the law of God is served. But as our minds have surrendered, yielded to sin, they have themselves become sinful and weak and are led away by the power of sin in the flesh. So the difference here is that we have, we have two different minds. One is the mind of the spirit. The way that God created us intentionally is that the mind is the ruling power. The flesh does not rule. And so in order to have a mind that can rule the flesh, we need the mind of Christ because our mind has become corrupted because of sin. It's been it's surrendered or yielded to sin. Now, the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh and in it was all that is in our flesh, all the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh or in his flesh. Now, Parminder tried to teach that that wasn't in the flesh at all. He tried to teach that the body is just um, the problem. But see, he distinguished between the body and the flesh. He had two different types of things, the body and the flesh. And he always put the flesh as the mind. So he was teaching that the flesh that's sinful is our sinful mind, is the mind of the flesh. But he distinguished that from the body. So he created a new type of holy flesh. Uh, another way around the problem or the direct statements in the spirit of prophecy. 
So you can see yourself in Parminder's way of thinking, the way that I understand it, is even if you saw yourself as sinning, you weren't. That was just your body. Your body just does things. And so you can ignore that because you have the mind of Christ. So you can see yourself as righteous, even if the evidence is that you are not righteous. And that's almost a close counterfeit because we are to see in Christ our righteousness, even though we see ourselves as sinners. But the difference here is that when we see ourselves as sinners, we, we forsake and confess our sins. We constantly look to Christ for righteousness. We don't look to ourselves for righteousness. But in Parminder's understanding, you can look for you to righteousness in yourself because you can believe you have it in your mind. That's how I understand what Parminder was teaching. So it's, it's a counterfeit and almost a close counterfeit. But the focus is not upon Christ's righteousness. It's upon our own righteousness that we imagine. It's a lower standard of righteousness. It's, it's a righteousness that is whatever I think is good, is good, even if it contradicts God's word. Uh, Craig said, takes that trust factor away. Right. The dependence of faith in trust in God for righteousness, because we see ourselves as sinners. The 144,000 are, are not going to have this confidence that they are righteous. Their confidence is completely in Christ. But they know that if they depend upon Christ, that his righteousness will be worked out in their lives. So they just trust in spite of what they feel, in spite of what they see about themselves. And because they're looking to Christ, they're going to see themselves as more sinful than somebody who doesn't look to Christ. Somebody who looks in the mirror that is Christ Jesus, the perfect law of liberty, will see himself as a sinner. He'll see himself as he is. Right. That's that's the whole idea of this revelation, the mirror vision of Christ is that we need to see ourselves as we are. So it says, now the flesh of Jesus Christ was our flesh and in it was all that is in our flesh. All the tendencies to sin that are in our flesh were in his flesh, drawing upon him to get him to consent to sin, right? It was drawing upon his mind. Suppose he had consented with his mind or to sin with his mind. What then? then his mind would have been corrupted and then he would have become of like passions with us. But in that case, he himself would have been a sinner. He would have been entirely enslaved and we all would have been lost. Everything would have perished. Now, I hate to use this example, um, and I don't even sure if I remember what the movie was called, but back about, I don't know if it was 15, 20 years ago, there was a movie um, about Christ that had to do with um, passion, passion of Christ. No, not that one. This one, it was, it was dealing with a sinful Christ. And in, in the story, my understanding of, because I read about it was that um, Jesus imagines or takes the option of bypassing the cross and then sees the results of that. It's like the sinful Christ, or I can't remember what it's called. It doesn't really matter. You don't want to watch it. Anyway, the point is that what this, this guy had a belief that Jesus had been a sinner, but then overcame sin. That is, in taking upon himself, he was made with like passions as we are, but, but then had to overcome. And of course, this is a distortion of the scriptures. Christ could overcome those passions without ever submitting to them. In fact, if he had ever submitted to those passions, then he could never have been our savior. He had to be sinless. That is, he had to have a victory over sin, not just eventually having a victory. He had to have that victory from the beginning all the way through. Um, 
So the thing is, if Christ had consented with his mind, he would have been a sinner, right? And Christ wasn't a sinner. He would have been entirely enslaved and we all would have been lost. Everything would have perished. So Christ gained a victory so that everything could be saved, including us as individuals. And um, it's interesting, too, if you think about um, the fact that Christ didn't have to overcome sin as a sinner. That is, he, he felt everything that a sinner feels, but he didn't sin. Now, the 144,000 who are redeemed will have their sins blotted out. That is, they won't have any memory of sin, right? All their, their sins have gone beforehand to judgment and been blotted out so they cannot bring to, them to remembrance, tell them what it says. But yet they are in the same position as Christ. That is, they're going to feel that they're a sinner because Christ felt that he was a sinner. But they're going to know by faith that they aren't. And, and you can see how Parminder's counterfeit is very close. The problem is, in Parminder's view, you actually see yourself as sinless, which is the complete opposite of what happens once you, you um, experience Christ. Now, there's another point about the 144,000. So, I have a belief, and some people may not agree with me on this, but the 144,000 are represented in the sanctuary uh, with the Lord's goat. That is, we know the Lord's goat represents Christ. Azazel, the scapegoat, represents Satan. But Satan and his followers will experience uh the judgment against sin. They will experience that judgment against sin, the second death, when they're finally wiped out and extinguished. But so we can say that Azazel represents Satan and his followers. We could say that. I mean, it's ultimately it's Satan. And the Lord's goat represents the completed work of Christ in his people. Because the Lord's goat comes after the sins have been blotted out and placed upon the head of the scapegoat. And we saw in Ellen White's early writings when she talks about this, that she uses this illustration that the scapegoat tries to escape. And if he escaped, then all would be lost, right? And this is this period of the seven last plagues. It parallels that. So my view is that the Lord's goat represents the completed work of Christ in his, in his followers. And that when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then shall he come to claim them as his own. And we know all these died in faith, having not received the promise that they without us would not be made perfect. That is, we know that the, all those that died in faith, and when we talk about the us, the us is that final generation. Without that final generation, all those that died in faith cannot receive the promises until that work is completed. Now, it's true there are some special resurrection, certain people, because there's, there's exceptions. But really, the salvation of all who are in heaven now or who will ever be in God's kingdom is dependent upon that final generation demonstrating that what Jesus did on the cross is real. And so when Jesus says, uh, let him that is filthy be filthy still, none of the, right, the unrighteous, none of the wicked ever depart from their wickedness. And he that is righteous be righteous still, none of the righteous ever depart from their righteousness. And so it demonstrates the security of heaven, that those that God has chosen to be in heaven and those that he has chosen for destruction is certain. And the thousand years is going to be the time in which we examine those books 
and look at these cases and recognize that God's judgment is just. And at the end of the thousand years, even the wicked themselves will accept the judgment that they are unrighteous and that they are unfit for heaven. So God's system of addressing sin in the universe shows that he is, um, uh, I can't think of the words that are used in scriptures, but um, it shows his righteousness and also his mercy. It shows his his whole character. So the fairness of God's system in dealing with sin is something that is is really hard for people to grasp. So uh, Jones says, I now read from the New Life of Christ, advanced copy upon this very point. So he's talking about the desire of ages. It is true that Christ at one time said of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. John 14, 30. Satan um, finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. Where does he start the temptation? So this is Jones now in the flesh. Satan reaches the mind through the flesh. God reaches the flesh through the mind. Satan controls the mind through the flesh. Through this means, through the lusts of the flesh, the lusts of the eyes, the pride of life, and through ambition for the world and the honor and respect of men, through these things, Satan draws upon us and upon our minds to get us to yield. Our minds respond and we cherish that thing. But this means, by this means, his temptations assert their power. Then we have sinned. But until that drawing of our flesh is cherished, there is no sin. There is temptation, but not sin. Every man is tempted when he is drawn away thus and enticed. And when lust has conceived, when that desire is cherished, then it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And we've heard some people who have said, you know, Satan doesn't tempt me anymore, which is a delusion. Every man is tempted. How we respond is the real issue, and we need the mind of Christ to do that. Jones goes on, some sinful desire with us is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. Uh, I think this is the spirit of prophecy here. So he, they have this. So some sinful desires cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But he could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. Jesus did not consent to sin. But even by a thought could he be brought to yield to the power of temptation. So uh, thus you see that where the victory comes, where the battlefield is, is right upon the line between the flesh and the mind. The battle is fought in the realm of the thoughts. The battle against the flesh, I mean, is fought altogether. And the victory won in the realm of the thoughts. Therefore, Jesus Christ came in just such flesh as ours, but with a mind that held its integrity against every temptation, against every inducement to sin, a mind that never consented to sin. No, not never in the least conceivable shadow of a thought. And by that means, he has brought that divine mind to every man on earth. Therefore, every man, for the choosing and by choosing, can have that divine mind that conquers sin in the flesh. Dr. Young's translation of 1 John 5.20 is, You know that the Son of God has come and hath given us a mind. The German says the same thing exactly in the Greek. Two, he has given us a mind. To be sure he has. That is what he came for. We had the carnal mind, the mind that followed Satan and yielded to the flesh. And what was it that enslaved Eve's mind? Oh, she saw that the tree was good for food. It was not good for any such thing. The appetite, the lusts of the flesh, the desires of the flesh led her off. She took of the tree and did eat. The appetite led and enslaved the mind, that is, the mind of the flesh, and that is enmity against God. It comes from Satan. In Jesus Christ, it is destroyed by the divine mind, which he brought into the flesh. By this divine mind, he put the enmity underfoot and kept it there. By this, he condemned sin in the flesh. So 
There is our victory. In him is our victory. And it is all in having that mind which was in him. Oh, it is all told in the beginning. There came in this enmity, and Satan took man captive and enslaved the mind. God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Who was her seed? Christ. It, her seed, shall bruise the head, and thou shalt bruise his head? No, no, sir. Thou shalt bruise his heel. All that Satan could do with Christ was to entice the flesh, to lay temptations before the flesh. He could not affect the mind of Christ. But Christ reaches the mind of Satan, where the enmity lies, and where it exists, and he destroys that wicked thing. It is all told there in the story of Genesis. The blessedness of it is, Satan can only deal with the flesh. He can stir up the desires of the flesh. But the mind of Christ stands there and says, no, no. The law of God is to be served, and the body of flesh must come under. We shall have to follow this thought further, but even only so far there is blessing, there is joy, there is salvation in it for every soul. Therefore, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That conquers sin in the sinful flesh. By his promises, by his promise, we are made partakers of the divine nature. Divinity and humanity are united once more when the divine mind of Jesus Christ, by his divine faith, abides in human flesh. Let them be united in you, and be glad and rejoice forevermore in it. Thus you see, the mind which we have is the flesh, flesh's mind, it is controlled by the flesh, and it came to us from whom? Satan. Therefore, it is enmity against God. And that mind of Satan is the mind of self, always self, in the place of God. Now, Christ came to bring to us another mind than that. While we have Satan's mind, the flesh ruling, we can serve the law of sin. God can reveal to us his law, and we can consent that that is good, and desire to fulfill it, and make resolutions to do so, and sign bargains, and make contracts even. But I see another law in my members, in my flesh, warring against the law of my mind, against that desire, that wish of my mind that delights in the law of God and brings me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am. But Christ comes and brings another mind, the spirit's mind, to us and gives us that. He gives us a mind and we have his mind by his Holy Spirit. Then and therefore, with the mind, the spirit's mind, the mind of Christ, which he has given us, the law of God is served. Thank the Lord. Now, so just to deal with this a little bit, uh, he says, so to see the difference in the seventh of Romans. So we'll go and read this here. There is described the man in whom the flesh rules and leads the mind astray against the will of the man even. In the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians, verses 26 to 27, it just is described the man in whom the mind has control. That is the Christian. The mind has control of the body, and the body is under, and he keeps it under. Therefore, it is written in another place. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the ruling, by the renewing of your mind. So I just want to deal with this part. This is where I disagree with Jones. Not, not in his basic belief system here, but just in his understanding of the text itself. So we're going to go there. We're going to go to Romans 7. Now, of course, I could be the one that's wrong, and Jones could be the one that's right. But I'm just saying that this is how I understand this. So we're going to go to Romans, Romans 7. Okay, so in Romans 7, and... and in Romans 6, he's going to talk about uh, the woman, um, the marriage contract. Um, but um, he's going to talk about baptism and, and different things, the symbols that they are. But what I want to point out is that, um, let me get rid of all the Greek here. So the law of sin. Now, what he's talking about here, what Paul is talking about, is what the law of sin is. Now, Paul sometimes is hard to understand. 
Um, but here he's talking about the law, and he shows that the law is what reveals that we are sinners. Right? I would not have known lust except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. Then he says, wherefore, the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. This is the purpose of the law. That's why it's holy. It is showing us that we're sinners. And also uh, sin, it says, for sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived, it, deceived me and by it slew me. So he is talking about a person who's a sinner, who has um, seen himself as a sinner now because he's comparing himself to the law so it's saying it's not saying that the law is causing a person to sin but sin taking occasion by the commandment there could be a better way of taking this but sin by being viewed in the context of the commandment deceives me and by that commandment slews me kills me so sin shows me that i'm a sinner and this killing of me is a good thing right here sin is doing this but in this context sin is something that needs to be exposed when it's exposed by the commandment it's going to show that it was deceived that we've been deceived and that we need to die and any thoughts on that it, it's a rather complicated no matter how you read this verse because he's going to say died, died, died of self right um, so sin right the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death because of sin because of sin, the commandment shows that we need to die. That's what he's trying to say there. That's how I take it. And for this reason, the law is holy. The commandment is holy and just and good. And then he tries to, to clarify this. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good. So you can see. How sin, it causes this death because of this something that is good, which is the law of God. Because sin needs to be shown to be sin. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. So the commandment reveals what sin really is. That's what the law is supposed to do. And then Paul says... For we know that the law is spiritual. Now, the Jews didn't necessarily see the law in, in that way. That is, they didn't use the law in that way. That is, they took the word, the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. But Paul's talking here about the law in its truest sense. But I am carnal, that is fleshly. So he contrasts spiritual and fleshly. But I am carnal, sold under sin. Jeff, you have a comment? Your mic's off. Uh, no, no. <clears throat> For, and now he's going to tell you something about the law and about us. So he says, For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that I do. Right. So we take this, well, this is taught somebody who's a sinner, right? <clears throat> um, right, that's how we take this. But he's talking here about the law. His point is not so much about the condition of the sinner, but about what the law is. Because he's trying to show that the law is good, that the law is spiritual, and I'm carnal. 
So even if I acknowledge the law with my mind, because I have the mind of the flesh, right? I would see, I would desire to do good, but I cannot do it. So he says in verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. That is, I haven't consented to it because I'm not doing it, but there's sin. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now, this is what he's talking about here. So he's talking about the law and what the law shows. And the law shows that, and we can know this by the law, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So our flesh has nothing good to recommend itself to God. For to will is present with me. That is, I can desire to do God's law, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. Now he's going to be talking about what the flesh is. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do what I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. So he keeps saying that it's sin that doing that's doing this, and this confuses people. It's almost as if He's saying, well, I didn't do it. This is just sin. But what he's talking about is his nature, his flesh. That is, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. So when he says, it's the sin that dwells in me, that's the sin in my flesh. That's that's the mind of the flesh, right? Yeah. Carnal soul under sin. Yeah. So then he says, I find then a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members that is in the flesh, right? Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Now, I want to point out how I understand this. When Paul is talking here, he's not talking about his present personal experience, right? He's not, in in a sense, he's not saying, this is how I am. I just can't do good things at all. And so I just trust in Jesus. He's going to deliver me from this. That's how some people take it. Now, another thing. Yeah. So they'll say that this is Paul in the present after his conversion, right? That's what they'll say. Then you have another group saying, no, 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 no. This is Paul talking about his past experience. Now, if we think about it, is it always true that I know that is in my flesh dwells no good thing? Is that always true, even after we're converted? Yeah, you come to realization of that. Right. So it's always true. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. That is always true of our flesh. So what he's describing is human flesh. He's not talking about his personal experience, either in the past or in the present. He's talking about the general experience that all of us have because of the flesh. So we can all say this. Now, In verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is exactly the experience that Christ had. But who was able to deliver Christ? Only his father, right? So this shows the nature of the flesh. This is the the body. This is the flesh. This is the nature of the flesh. That Christ took upon himself. All of these things here in Romans 7. Christ would say of himself. I know that in me. That is in my flesh. Dwells no good thing. Because he knew that. He could then depend upon his father. So when he says. Oh wretched man that I am. Who should deliver me from the body of this death. The one who does it. Is the one who had taken upon himself. This body of death. 
If Christ hadn't taken upon himself the body of this death, he would have no one, we would have no one to deliver us from the body of this death. Can we see that? Yeah, I see that. Okay. So I hope people can see that. Some some people have a hard time understanding when I explain this. But the, to me, this is just talking about the body, the type of body that Christ took. It's, it's a body that is enmity against God. The law is spiritual, but I am carnal, right? I'm at enmity, or I'm enmity. My body is. My flesh is enmity against God. So even if in my flesh I desire to do good, many people desire to do good, but they can't do it because their desire is just a desire of the flesh. Right? We need to be delivered from this body of death. And that's why he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, I, my, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. That is, if I have the carnal, the carnal mind, I won't serve the law of God. I have to have the mind of Christ. But with the flesh, that is the mind of the flesh, I would serve sin. So in chapter 8, he explains this further. He says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh. That is, none of those people who are in Christ Jesus are walking after what their flesh is telling them to do, but they walk after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, because the law cannot do this, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For if they, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit do mind the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So, so they that then, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now we have our bodies; we still have our flesh, right? But we're not in the flesh, right? Because Paul says you are not in the flesh. He's not saying that we have holy flesh. Right? He doesn't say we get a new body when we become a Christian. So, so this is what Jones has been addressing. <clears throat> um, so be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind so we can see it's the mind that needs to be removed renewed so if we understand this problem of this holy flesh movement that had happened in the past and we've had it in different sort of uh, flavors I guess you might say different colors different models of holy flesh trying to disguise what they are. Um, if we understand that the renewing of our mind uh, brings about um, a dependence upon God, a trust in the Father, that we can overcome sin, and that that trust is by faith and not by sight, then we can experience the peace of knowing that we are walking with God because each day, each moment we look to him, not to ourselves, for righteousness. We don't expect to see righteousness there. We only expect to see sin. And that sin, when we see it, is confessed and forsaken. If we saw ourselves as a sinner and just kept sinning and, and did, weren't too concerned about it, you're saying, well, I'm always going to see myself as a sinner, so it's fine. Uh, that would be wrong. right? So we know that. When we see ourselves as a sinner, we need to confess and forsake those sins. And obviously a person who uh, diminishes his sins eventually doesn't see his sin as sin at all. He sees it as good, as righteousness. So he can't even see his sins anymore. So if we see our sins and aren't startled by them, 
um, and just accept them, that also is another dangerous error. Okay, so let's, I didn't share, change the screen here. Um, so he says here, the Greek word is the same word exactly as that. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. He is a new creature, not an old man changed over, but a new made one. So this is not an old mind made over, but a new created mind. That is the mind of Christ wrought in us by the spirit of God, giving us the mind of Christ and so making us entirely an entirely new mind in us and for us. This is shown in Romans 8th chapter. They that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Because they do the works of the flesh, the mind follows sin that way. But they, after the spirit, mind the things of the spirit. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. That which brings to us the mind of Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. Indeed, the spirit of God brings Jesus Christ to us, Jesus Christ himself to us. By the Holy Ghost, the real presence of Christ is with us and dwells in us. Can he bring Christ to us without bringing the mind of Christ to us? Assuredly not. So then in the nature of things, there is the mind of Christ, which he came into the world to give us. Now see how this follows further and what it costs to do that and how it was done. The mind of the flesh is the minding of self. It is enmity against God and is controlled through the flesh. Jesus Christ came into this flesh himself, the glorious one. He who made the worlds, the word of God, was made flesh himself, and he was our flesh. And he, that divine one who was in heaven and was in our sinful flesh, and he, that divine one who was in heaven, was in, was in our sinful flesh. Yet that divine one, when in sinful flesh, never manifested a particle of his divine self in resisting the temptations that were in that flesh that emptied himself. Now, this is another important point that Jones brings up, is that Christ could not use his divine self to overcome sin. He had the power to overcome sin and the temptations, but he didn't use that power. He had to use another power because he emptied himself. We are here studying the same subject that we have been studying these three or four years, but God is leading us further along in the study of it. And I'm glad we have been studying for th three. We have been studying for three or four years. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who emptied himself. That mind must be in us in order for us to, uh, to be emptied, but we cannot of ourselves empty ourselves. Nothing but divinity can do that. That is an infinite thing. Can the mind of Satan empty itself of self? No. Can the mind that is in us, that minding of self, empty itself of self? No. Self cannot do it. Jesus Christ, the divine one, the infinite one, came in his divine person in this same flesh of ours, and never allowed his divine power, his personal self, to be manifested at all in resisting these temptations and enticements and drawings of the flesh. What was it then that conquered sin there and kept him from sinning? It was the power of God, the Father, that kept him. Now, where does that touch us here? We cannot empty ourselves, but his divine mind comes into us, and by that divine power, we can empty ourselves of our wicked selves. And then by that divine power, the mind of Jesus Christ, of God, the Father, comes to us and keeps us from the power of temptation. Thus Christ, emptying his self, his righteous self, brings to us the power by which we are em emptied of our wicked selves. And this is how he abolished in his flesh the enmity and made it possible for the enmity be de to be destroyed in you and me. Do you see that? I know it takes close thinking. I know too that when you have thought upon that and have got it clearly, then the mind cannot go any further. Then we come face to face with the mystery of God itself. And human finite intellect must stop and say, this is holy ground. 
that is beyond my measure. I can go no further. I surrender to God. Question comes from the audience. Did not Christ depend on God to keep him? The answer, yes. That is what I am saying. That is the point. Christ depended on the, in the Father all the time. Christ himself, who made the worlds, was all the time in that sinful flesh of mine and yours, which he took. He who made the worlds was there in his divine presence all the time. But never did he allow himself to appear at all or to do anything at all that was done. That was kept back. And when these temptations come upon him, he could have annihilated them all with the assertion in righteousness of his divine self. But if he had done so, it would have ruined us to have asserted himself, to have allowed himself to appear, even in righteousness would have ruined us because we who are only wicked never would have had anything before us then but the manifestation of self. Set before men who are only wicked manifestation of self, even in divine righteousness, as an example to be followed, you simply make men that much more confirmed in selfishness and the wickedness of selfishness. Therefore, in order that we in our wicked selves might be delivered from our wicked selves, the divine one, the holy one, kept under, surrendered, emptied all the manifestation of his righteous self. And that does accomplish it. He accomplished it by keeping himself back all the time and leaving everything entirely to the Father to hold him against these temptations. He was conqueror through the grace and power of the Father, which came to him upon his trust and upon his emptying himself of self. Now, there, there's a bit more to this, too. I think, I think Jones could have said this better. Um, not often would I say that about Jones, but in this case, I think part of it is not just so much the manifestation of self. Um, but we need to depend upon it. What, what's here more is almost a type of self-dependence. Maybe, maybe that's what he's trying to say. Because if Christ had just depended upon his own divine nature, he's doing, he's giving an example that we can't follow. We can't trust in our own divine nature. We have to trust in the Father. And if we are to trust in our righteousness, it would only be self-righteousness. So I think that's what Jones is trying to say, but it's just rather long and complicated. <clears throat> the other thing is that Christ in overcoming temptation also, um, and I think he's going to go into this. I can't, yeah, this is the part that he's going to say, just what I was going to think of. There's where you and I are now. There's where it comes to you and me. We are tempted. We are tried. And there's always room for us to assert ourselves when we undertake to make things move. There are suggestions which rise that such and such things are too much for even a Christian to bear. And that Christian humility is not intended to go as far as that. And someone strikes you on the cheek or breaks your wagon or tools or you may stone your tent at meeting house. Satan suggests now, you send those fellows up. You take the law to them. Christians are not to bear such things as that in the world. That is not fair. And you answer him, that is so. There's no use of that. You will teach those fellows a lesson. Yes, and perhaps you do. But what is that? That is self-defense. That is self-replying. No. Keep back that wicked self. Let God attend to the matter. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, said the Lord. That is what Jesus Christ did. He was spit upon. And he was taunted. He was struck upon the face. His hair was pulled. A crown of thorns was put upon his head. And in mockery, the knee was bowed with hail king of the Jews. They blindfolded him and then struck him and cried, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? All that was put upon him. And in his human nature, he bore all that because his divine self was kept back. Was there any suggestion to him, suppose you, to drive back that riotous crowd, to let loose one manifestation of his divinity and sweep away the whole wicked company? Satan was there to suggest it to him, if nothing else. What did he do? He stood defenseless as the Lamb of God. There was no assertion of his divine self, no sign of it. Only the man standing there, leaving all to God to do whatsoever he pleased. He said to Pilate, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. That is the faith of Jesus. 
And that is the prop that is what the prophecy means when it says, He are they to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. We are to have that divine faith of Jesus Christ, which comes to us in the gift of the mind which He gives. And that mind which He gives to me will exercise in me the same faith it exercised in Him. So we keep the faith of Jesus. So then there was he, by that self-surrender, keeping back his righteous self and refusing ever to allow it to appear under the most grievous temptations. And the spirit of prophecy tells us that what was brought upon him there in the night of his betrayal were the very things that were the hardest for human nature to submit to. But he, by the keeping back of his divine self, caused human nature to submit to it by the power of the Father, who kept him from sinning. And by that means, he brings us to that same divine mind, that same divine power, that when we shall be taunted, when we shall be stricken upon the face, when we shall be spit upon, when we shall be persecuted, as he was, as shortly we shall be. That divine mind was, which was in him being given to us, will keep back our natural selves, our sinful selves, and we will leave all to God. Then the Father will keep us now in him, as he kept us then in him. That is our victory, and there is how he destroyed the enmity for us. And in him, it is destroyed in us. Thank the Lord. I will read a portion now from the spirit of prophecy that will help in the understanding of the subject. First from an article published in the Review and Herald of July 5th, 1887. It is so good that I will read a few passages to go into the bulletin with this lesson so that all can have it, and so that all may know for certain that the steps we have taken in this study are exactly correct. The apostle would call our attention from ourselves to the author of our salvation. He presents before us his two natures, human and divine. Here is the description of the divine, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He was the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now of that human, he was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. He voluntarily assumed human nature. It was his own act, and by his own consent, he clothed his divinity with humanity. He was all the while as God, but he did not appear as God. He veiled the demonstrations of deity, which had commanded the homage and called forth the admiration of the universe of God. He was God while upon earth, but he divested himself of the form of God and in its stead took the form and fashion of man. He walked the earth as a man. For our sakes, he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might become rich. He laid aside his glory and his majesty. He was God, but the glories of the form of God, he for a while relinquished. Though he walked among men in poverty, scattering his blessings wherever he went, at his words, legions of angels would surrender, would surround their redeemer and do him homage. When Peter, at the time of Christ's betrayal, resisted the officers and took the sword and raised it and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus said, put up your sword. Don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels? But he walked on the earth unrecognized, unconfessed, with but few exceptions by his creatures. The atmosphere was polluted with sin and with curses instead of the anthems of praise. His lot was poverty and humiliation. As he passed to and fro on his mission of mercy to relieve the sick, he lifted up the oppressed, scarce a solitary voice called him blessed, and the greatest of the nation passed him by with disdain. Contrast this with the riches of glory, the wealth of praise pouring forth from immortal tongues, the millions of rich voices in the universe of God in anthems and ad of adoration. But he humbled himself and took mortality upon him. As a member of the human family, he was mortal, but as God, he was the fountain of life to the world. He could, in his divine person, ever have withstood the advances of death and refused to come under its dominion, but he voluntarily laid down his life, that in doing so, he might give life and bring immortality 
to light. He bore the sins of the world and endured the penalty which rolled like a mountain upon his divine soul. He yielded up his life a sacrifice that man might not eternally die. He died not by being compelled to die, but by his own free will. This was humility. The whole treasure of heaven was poured out in one gift to save fallen man. He brought into his human nature all the life-giving energies that human beings will need and must receive. And he brings it into my human nature. Okay? To your human nature at our choice by the spirit of God bringing to us his divine presence and emptying us of ourselves and causing God to appear instead of self. Wondrous combination of man and God. He might have helped his human nature to stand the inroads of disease by pouring from his divine nature vitality and undecaying vigor to the human. But he humbled himself to man's nature. He did this that the scripture might be fulfilled. And the plan was entered into by the Son of God, knowing all the steps in his humiliation that he must descend to make an ex expiation for the sins of the condemned, groaning world. But humility was this. It amazed the angels. The tongue can never describe it. The imagination can never take it in. But we can take it in, Jones goes on, we can take in the blessed fact and enjoy the benefit of that to all eternity. And God will give us eternity in which to take in the rest. The eternal word consented to be made flesh. God became man. He became man. What am I? A man. What are you? A man. He became ourselves and God with him. Is God with us. But he stepped still lower. What's still lower than that? Yes, sir. The man that is Christ humbled himself as a man because we need to humble ourselves. He is not only humbled himself as God, but when he became man, he humbled himself as a man so that we might humble ourselves to God. He emptied himself as God and became a man. And then as man, he humbled himself that we might humble ourselves and all that and all that we might be saved. It is. In it is salvation. Shall we not take it and enjoy it day and night and be ever just as thankful as Christians? But he stepped still lower. The man must humble himself as a man to bear insult, reproach, shameful accusations and abuse. There seemed to be no safe place for him in this, his, his own territory. He had to flee from place to place for his life. He was betrayed by one of his disciples. He was denied by one of the most zealous followers. He was mocked. He was crowned with a crown of thorns. He was scourged. He was forced to bear the burden of the cross. He was not insensible to this contempt and ignominy. He submitted, but oh, he felt the bitterness as no other being could feel it. He was pure, holy, and undefiled, yet arraigned as a criminal. The adorable Redeemer stepped down from the, the high exaltation. Step by step, he humbled himself to die. But what a death. It was the most shameful, the most cruel. The death on the cross as a malefactor. Um, he did not die as a hero in the eyes of the world, loaded with honors as men die in battle. He died a condemned criminal, suspended between the heavens and the earth. Died a lingering death of shame, exposed to the revilings and tauntings of a debased, Crime-loaded, profligate multitude. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot up their lip. They shake their head. Psalm 22, 7. He was numbered with the transgressors, and, in, and his kinsmen, according to the flesh, disown him. His mother beheld his humiliation, and she, he was forced to see the sword pierce her heart. He endured the cross, despised the shame. He made it of small account in consideration of the results he was working out in behalf of not only the inhabitants of this speck of a world, but the whole universe, every world which God had created. Christ was to die as man's substitute. Man was a criminal under sentence of death for transgression of the law of God as a traitor, a rebel. Hence, a substitute for man must die as a malefactor. He stood in the place of the traitors with all their treasured sins upon his divine soul. 
It was not enough that Jesus should die in order to meet the demands of the broken law. But he died a shameful death. The prophet gives to, gives to the world his words, I hid not my face from shame and spitting. In consideration of this, can men have one particle of self-exaltation? As they trace down the life and humiliation and sufferings of Christ, can they lift their proud heads as though they were to bear no shame, no trials, no humiliation? I say to the followers of Christ, look to Calvary and blush for shame at your self-important ideas. All this humiliation of the majesty of heaven was for guilty, condemned man. He went lower and lower in his humiliation until there were no depths, no lower depths he could reach in order to lift up man from his moral defilement. How low down were we then when, in order to lift us up from the moral defilement he had, he had to go step by step lower and lower until there were no lower depths he could reach? Think of it and see how low we were. All this was for you who are striving for the supremacy, striving for human praise, for human exaltation, who are afraid you will not receive all that praise, all that deference from human minds that you think is your due. Is this Christ-like? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He died to make an atonement and to be a pattern for everyone who would be his disciple. Shall selfishness come into your hearts? And shall those who set not before them the pattern, Jesus, extol your merits? You have none, except as they come through Jesus Christ. Shall pride be harbored after you have seen deity humbling himself? And then is man debasing himself until as man there were no lower depths to which he could descend? Be astonished, O ye heavens, and be amazed, O ye inhabitants of the earth, that such return should be made to our Lord. What contempt, what wickedness, what formality, what pride, what efforts made to lift up man and glorify himself? And the Lord of glory humbled himself, agonized, and died the shameful death on the cross in your behalf. Who is learning the meekness and lowliness of the pattern? Who is striving earnestly to master self? Who is lifting his cross and following Jesus? Who is wrestling against self-conceit? Who is setting himself in good earnest and with all his energies to overcome satanic envies, jealousies, evil surmisings, and lasciviousness, cleansing the soul temple from all defilements and opening, opening the door of the heart for Jesus to come in. Would that these words might have that impression on the mind, that all who read them might cultivate the grace of humility, be self-denying, more disposed to esteem others better than themselves, having the mind and spirit of Christ to bear one another's burdens. Oh, that we might write deeply on our hearts as we contemplate the great condescension and humiliation to which the Son of God descended, that we might be partakers of the divine nature. Now I read a few lines from the advanced pages of the new life of Christ. In order to carry out the great work of redemption, the Redeemer must take the place of fallen man. Burdened with the sins of the world, he must go over the ground where Adam stumbled. He must take up the work just where Adam failed and endure a test of the same character but infinitely more severe than that which had vanquished him. It is impossible for man to fully comprehend Satan's temptations to our Savior. Every enticement to evil, which man finds so difficult to resist, was brought to bear upon the Son of God in as much greater degree as his character was superior to that of fallen man. When Adam was assailed by the tempter, he was without the taint of sin. He stood before God in the strength of perfect manhood. All the organs and faculties of his being fully developed and harmoniously balanced. He was surrounded with the things of beauty and communed daily with the holy angels. What a contrast to this perfect being did the second Adam present. As he entered the desolate wilderness to cope with Satan, for 4,000 years the race had been decreasing in size and physical strength and deteriorating in moral worth. And in order to elevate fallen man, Christ must reach him where he stood. He assumed human nature, bearing the infirmities and degeneracy of the race. He humiliated himself to the lowest depths of human woe. 
that he might sympathize with man and rescue him from the degradation into which sin had plunged him. For it became him for who are all for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Hebrews 2.10. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that, them that obey him. Hebrews 5.9. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be made that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he's able to succor them that are tempted. Hebrews 2, verse 17 and 18. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. It is true that Christ at one time said of himself, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me, John 14, 30. Satan finds in human hearts some point where he can gain a foothold. Some sinful desire is cherished by means of which his temptations assert their power. But he could find nothing in the Son of God that would enable him to gain the victory. Jesus did not consent to sin. Not even by a thought could he be brought to the power of Satan's temptations. Yet it was written of Christ that he was tempted to all points like as we are. Many hold that from the nature of Christ, it was impossible for Satan's temptations to weaken or overthrow him. In Christ, it could not have been placed in Adam's position to go over the ground where Adam stumbled and fell. He could not have gained the victory that Adam failed to gain unless he was placed in a position as trying as that in which Adam stood, he could not redeem Adam's failure. If man has in any sense a more trying conflict to endure than had Christ, then Christ is not able to succor them, him when tempted. Christ took humanity with all its liabilities. He took the nature of man with the possibility of yielding to temptation. And he relied upon divine power to keep, to keep him. The union of divine of the divine with the human is one of the most mysterious as well as the most precious truths of the plan of redemption. It is of this that Paul speaks when he says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. While it is impossible for finite minds fully to grasp this great truth or fathom its significance, we may learn from it lessons of vital importance to us in our struggles against temptation. Christ came to the world to bring divine power to humanity, to make man a partaker of the divine nature. You see, we are on the firm ground all the way, so that when it is said that he took our flesh but still was not a partaker of our passions, it is all straight, it is all correct, because his divine mind never consented to sin. And that mind is brought to us by the Holy Spirit that is freely given unto us. We know the Son of God has come and hath given us a mind, and we have the mind of Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? This was a little bit longer than some of the studies. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you can take over our lives, that we can have the mind of Christ, that all these things that we hold on to, that they can be conquered by our connection with him. Help us to see our sin, to confess it, forsake it, to rely upon your strength, that we can show forth your glory, not ours. Thank you for the gift of your son who has stepped down so low to bring us up to him. Bless each one this Sabbath and bring us together again to study your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.